hi and welcome back to the channel yes i'm still doing the no rewatch january but i'm giving myself a bit of a breather from it as we head toward the end of the month and we're doing a question and answer from the people on the community tab of the youtube channel and i've got some interesting questions so i'm going to read them off and then i'm going to answer them and if it's relevant i'll do a bit of show and tell as well so uh sit back relax and uh you never know when an interesting question is going to come around so stick around to the end so first one i've got which i'm going backwards chronologically so this is the most recent one that i've got this one's from brian edwards it says i rewatched the night to remember last night i'm fond of kenneth moore gee it's an atmospheric movie it's not often that a british movie of that era makes me feel so uncomfortable i've not seen titanic because when it came out all my mates said it was a chick flick and i couldn't get anyone to go with me i hate going to the cinema alone do they compare or were my mates right well I, I, not to remember, I like it. It's a fine film. There was a 1950s version of Titanic, an American one, with Clifton Webb in it, which I hated because um, because of my messed up childhood. A little kid decided to stay on the boat with his father, and that annoyed the hell out of me because I didn't have a good relationship with my father. But as for Titanic, I was actually working for a cable TV company in the call centre when Titanic was streaming on there. So I saw Titanic in chunks. I'm still not convinced I've seen all of it. But based on what I remember of it from around the turn of the century, just watch it. I mean, you know, it, it's a movie. Just watch it if you get the opportunity to. It's going to do no harm. Whether it's a chick flick or not, you're probably going to get something out of the special effects. And there are a few good character actors in there. So just go with it. And, um, you know, you can reminisce about the old jokes about Leonardo DiCaprio looking like a young lesbian in the movie. All of that kind of stuff you can just grok on. But if you're dithering on whether to watch a movie, you probably spend more time dithering about it than you will the time it takes to watch the movie. So the advice is just watch it. Uh, don't can't do any harm. But I really hate the 1950s American Titanic. Ed Dale, uh, hi Ed, says, I was wondering whether you'd seen a history of time travel and your thoughts on the way it used constraints to tell its story. I actually did a video, it's on one of my hidden gem videos. I forget which one, but if you go back, you'll see them. I did a bunch of science fiction movies people should watch and a history of time travel is on that i really like the way that a limited budget in a film can often give people a different way to tell the story they have to use their imagination they have to use their resources that they do have to tell it and a history of time travel does that wonderfully it's a cute little movie and the conceit in it is wonderful and i like the way the story is told it uh, those constraints work strongly towards making it a better film than it might have been with a larger budget. Let's have a look here. Uh, Michael Mayer says, another director with absolutely weirdest films. Well, you know, you can go John Waters if you like. You can go some David Lynch, whose movies tend to be very dreamlike and nightmarish. Um, you can, some of Richard Elfman's movies, things like uh, Forbidden Zone, are uh, wild. So anything that was on a midnight movie in the 1970s and the 1980s at an encore art house cinema. Um, they will be the movies I'd go for. Just go back, look through the archives, and there are archives around of these things. But Midnight Movies would be the one. There are a few reference books about Midnight Movies, so the way to kind of find the best of that is to just grab the reference books, and I recommend them above going to websites because you can find out so much more from a reference book than you can from somebody who kind of distilled from a reference book. Midnight movies are the way to go. Um, Michael Mayer says, another director you think can be great, but has yet to achieve it. Um, I'd go with local Australian directors if I could, but the one I really like who has turned more to producing is Ivan Sen, who directed uh, Mystery Road and Goldstone. And also probably Warwick Thornton is another one. Uh, there are a few Indigenous filmmakers who are doing some really interesting stuff these days. And if you're looking at the interesting ones who really need to be better known than they are look for any um of the really good australian indigenous filmmakers at the moment because they are definitely doing things that other people aren't you'd also go with the people who made wormwood they're making a, a sequel to wormwood a movie called wormwood apocalypse which i haven't seen yet uh they've got a nice gonzo sensibility about them and i, I like the work that they do most disappointing director that started out great and fizzled out in my estimation say um alex Preuss. this is michael mayo again yeah alex Preuss is interesting because um he was really going at people who didn't like gods of egypt 
And I very politely on Facebook said to him, listen, you probably don't want to go and attack everybody who didn't like your movie. It's not going to work well for you in the long run. And he blocked me. So Alex Preuss is definitely one of those directors. It's a, a difficult one because sometimes you don't know whether the director crashed because they um, were given too much money in the case of M. Night Shyamalan or because uh, they, they had personal problems or just couldn't hack the way that particularly Hollywood uh, treats creative people. So, you know, that's a difficult one to, to talk about. And when you say disappointing directors, uh, people do go off track, but let's see, who would I think of? I really don't want to diss any directors in that regard because uh, they're all successful. If you get a film finished, you're successful at that level. But there are people who maybe need some people around them who help them become better rather than empowering what they want to do. Uh, that's always a problem with anybody who has a level of success is you can accidentally or deliberately surround yourself with yes men. And that's never a good thing for a creative person to do. Teresa Sylvia, who's your favorite movie composer? Which movie soundtracks do I enjoy the most? Um, I go Michelle Legrand. Fantastic, I love Michelle Legrand's music. I love The Umbrellas of Chabot, The Young Girls of Rochefort. I even like his soundtrack to Never Say Never Again, the James Bond film that was in canon that starred Sean Connery. But uh, I like his stuff. I even like the early stuff he did with Jacques Demi, like Lola and things like that. Um, and I liked uh, the music he added. And he was actually in Cleo from 5 to 7, the um, Agnes Varda movie. So I'm a big, big fan of Michel Legrand. I like the very few bits of music that Stephen Sondheim did for movies. He did things for Dick Tracy, for instance. He did uh, the soundtrack, I think, to Stavinsky, the Jean-Paul Belmondo movie. Uh, his, his music does stand up. I also like The Last of Sheila, the movie he co-wrote. So there's Sondheim there. And I like some of the kind of second tier Italian composers like Piero Piccioni and um, Rizzo Tolani. Those people really have some interesting work and they were incredibly prolific during the 50s, 60s and 70s. So that's kind of where my jam is. I like those guys. And I also really like the uh, soundtracks of David Raxon who did uh, The Bad and the Beautiful, Two Weeks in Another Town. He also did the soundtrack to a kind of lower budget Carol Baker movie I really like called Sylvia. I really like David Raxon's stuff as well. So they would be my go-tos uh, for that. And thank you very much, Teresa. Ed Dale has a question. Uh, dumb question. No, it isn't. There are no dumb questions. Where are we headed with movies in the future with an endemic virus that makes hanging out in a room with a group of people a one in a hundred chance of long-term health issues? Add in the splintering of the market into different streaming services offering tons of good films, bad films and crappy films. It's kind of tried to ask since we all see the issues and have our own perspective on it. But I have seen films as a mechanism for creating larger senses of community across the world. And it seems like we are losing that. Does YouTube and Amazon and Netflix offer a replacement? I think communities are going to change. I mean, this is a community of, of people talking about movies. And I, I like the feedback that I get on that. Yeah, I mean, we can't do a lot about the problems we've got at the moment. Yes, we've got um, vaccines and, we, and we've got uh, ways of social distancing and things like that. I think cinemas are going to be less people dense. Uh, things like the gold class cinemas that I go to, there's a nice separation between people that makes your chance of getting a virus a lot less. And they've also upped the amount of air they're flowing through the auditorium so that it becomes less of a problem. So I still like seeing movies in cinemas for big blockbuster films that really need that perspective. I think streaming services are doing a good job. I think Netflix has got the problem of having way too much money and uh, some of their product is lacking, though there are some interesting things they're doing. But they're putting out a lot of stuff and it's giving a lot of creative people a lot of opportunities. Whereas the, the old way of doing things maybe was a little more top heavy. Yeah, it's, it's changing, but I don't think it's a bad thing. I think people are still watching movies and who will talk about them all the time online. I love being in a crowd when something happens like the big reveal in the latest Spider-Man movie. There was a, an audible gasp in the crowd when that happened. And that was a nice buzz and that was a nostalgic buzz for me. And I enjoyed that and I don't want to lose that either. But I think adapting to change circumstances rather than railing against them is the way to go. Don't like it? No, we'd love to, things to be the way they were in 2018. But given that they're not, I think that what we've got to do is kind of ramp up our interactions with other people who like the same kind of stuff that we like 
and who maybe are going to steer us towards stuff that we don't know about that we like which is one of the things i'm trying to do with the channel i don't want to do the total nostalgia thing and just talk about old movies and i don't want to go to the other way which is an incredibly crowded space in youtube where you only talk about the movies that came out 15 minutes ago i think i want to balance everything there and do things in a, a number of different ways and i think that works really well for me steampunk with two e's nice name best and worst science fiction by roger corman in my estimation there's so many roger corman movies i like um i think frankenstein unbound the movie he made in 1990 is an interesting one um and it was i think john hurt was in it was based on a brian aldous novel i kind of like that one it's a bit of an outlier I also like The Intruder, the one where he had William Shatner playing a racist. Didn't make any money for Roger Corman, but it's really great. I think you've kind of got to embrace the aesthetic of Roger Corman because there are low budget things that he did that are totally trashy, but in the moment you enjoy it. Things like Bucket of Blood and, and the original Little Shop of Horrors, made on a shoestring, crazy. Some of the ones he did in the late fifties with really shitty monsters. I love them. I think that the Roger Corman thing is you either get Roger Corman or you don't. And trying to find a bad Roger Corman movie is difficult because they're all at the bottom line entertaining in their own way. And I kind of like that. Mystery Man. Hi, Terry. Is it true that the North Korean government kidnapped filmmakers to make their own movies? If that's true, who did the kidnapping? Who was kidnapped? And what movies were made? Yeah, it happened. I've actually found the Wikipedia page for it. Uh, the filmmakers were Shin Sung Ok and Choi Eun Hee. Shin Sung Ok was a famous South Korean film director. Uh, he was a producer of over 100 movies and 70 of them that he directed. He was known as the Prince of South Korean Cinema. And uh, he, yeah, they were kidnapped by North Korea, the North Korean government. In 1978, his wife Choi Eun Hee, his former wife Choi Eun Hee, was an actress. And uh, she was kidnapped in Hong Kong and taken to North Korea. Shin was suspected of causing her disappearance, but that really wasn't um, the case. And he traveled to Hong Kong to find out what happened to her. And the North Koreans kidnapped him. They were kidnapped on the orders of future leader Kim Jong-il. He wanted to establish a film industry in his country to sway international opinion regarding the views of the Workers' Party of Korea. Um, they, he made two escape attempts. He was put in prison for a couple of years and then uh, he made movies. The best known film he made was uh, Paul Gasari, which was a kaiju film. If you haven't seen Paul Gasari, it's pretty wild. But uh, they did get political asylum in the US Embassy in Vienna after in 1986. And uh, they ended up living for two years in Reston, Virginia under American protection. They then moved to Los Angeles and he worked in the 1990s under a pseudonym of Simon Sheen and directed Three Ninjas Knuckle Up and also another Three Ninjas movies. Um, he moved back to South Korea but he was a little bit nervous about doing that. And uh, his last movie as a director was an unreleased film called The Story of Winter. Um, he died and uh, in 2004, so yeah it happened. and. Uh, probably not the best way to go about things I'm sure there are any number of comedies you could do about kidnapping film directors to make your movie but that was actually a real thing that happened and I'm sure there's been at least a TV um, movie about it in South Korea but I'm not aware of it but it's uh, it's a weird thing and it shows that uh, dictators are gonna dictate Super Shecky says wondering if you have thoughts about the 1975 movie check the rain God I read it a couple of years ago there are parts of the film that stick in my mind. I've been trying to find a copy of Check the Rain God and haven't been able to, so sorry about that one, Super Shiki. Um, I'm kind of, if I, I've got that on my list, so if I find a copy of it, I'll talk about it on the channel, but uh, don't hold your breath because it's a little hard to find. Brian Edwards again says, does understanding drama ruin the viewing experience for you? Lately, I've been spotting guns over fireplaces all over cinema. It kind of blows dramatic tension. Yeah, Chekhov's gun, if there's a, gun in the room it's going to be fired eventually um no understanding drama doesn't ruin movies for me i like the way that people can kind of subvert my expectations there are always going to be movies that you can predict ahead of time you can pick the plot twist you can pick which character is the villain you can pick the little bits and pieces that are foreshadowed but i kind of like playing that game and again there are always going to be movies where the plot twists surprise us, even though we do know a lot about drama and know, and know a lot about the way 
that the three act structure works in movies. Um, movies can surprise us, and when they do, they delight us. And sometimes you can have a satisfying time anyway because you've got three character actors in secondary roles you really like. You like the director, you like the way the dialogue is presented. There are always going to be things that, that kind of fill out the wonderfulness that you want in a movie, even if the drama part you can kind of predict the beats of a little bit. Doesn't always happen, but it can happen, and it's fun when it does. Don't be wrong. I think a horror movie called Arnold with Roddy McDowell has disappeared. Thought it was not a bad movie, and also a movie. Um, okay, I'll start with. I'll stop there. I'll do your punctuation for you, Grant. Um, yeah, I've tried to find a copy of Arnold with Roddy McDowell. It's got an interesting cast. I think Victor Bueno is in it, and a few other people. But um, it may well be one that someone like Kino Lorber should put out. So. If anybody's got any contacts with Kino Lorber, you might want to look at that. The next sentence is also a movie A Man Called Horses Disappeared. Might be on Criterion. Richard Harris was a megastar at the time. Yeah, A Man Called Horses is a hard watch because he gets hung up by his pectoral muscles. Um, I'm not sure if it's really um, an honest portrayal of uh, First Nations Americans. There was that thing during the 1970s in particular where um, even though the 1960s and movies like Shy and Autumn gave us a more nuanced view of First Nations Americans. There was that kind of savagery sub-genre of westerns in the 1970s where A Man Called Horse and Blue and movies like that really played up to uh, the kind of untamed savage trope about uh, First Nations people so maybe that's why it's not really big. Uh, okay also The Trial of Billy Jack I believe is gone as well because it was heavily criticised uh, yeah I think there's a kind of right wing thing about Tom Lachlan's movies that doesn't sit well with contemporary beliefs I mean you know, I'll watch them, I watched Billy Jack when it came out, I even watched Tom Lachlan's movie The Master Gunfighter when it came out on um, in cinemas but yeah there, there are movies that are of their time and we've got a, I, I don't mind talking about them, I don't mind watching them as long as I can put them in context when I talk about them and uh, talk about the things that may be problematic about them and the things that aren't problematic about them. I think that there's room in our dialogue about movies where we can acknowledge the things that are really shitty in movies and acknowledge the things that are good in them as well. Um, let's see. And Grant goes on to say, Keep well, Terry, like all your shows. Living in New South Wales, way more variety of movies and shows to watch than for me in Canada. Uh, you just got to hunt around. I actually live in Victoria. I don't live in New South Wales. I was born in New South Wales. And I lived there for coming up to half my life. And then I moved to Victoria and moved to Melbourne. And I've lived here ever since. Actually, I had eight months in Canberra as well on the way through. But, uh, yeah, it's a matter of just finding the stuff and hunting it down. Um, half of being a movie buff these days is tracking things down, particularly if you like um, physical media. But for me, uh, I kind of like finding the things I used to watch and I can't find anymore. And also finding things that I didn't know about, which is the biggest delight I have. If I find a classic movie that I haven't seen before, I'll watch it. Even though it's at times with things like Gone with the Wind, it's crazily disappointing. So that's it for this time around. I may well break this video up into two pieces and, and put them out differently. So I think I will because this one's running crazy long and... YouTube only likes videos to be of a certain length, so I will do that. Anyway, uh, thank you very much for watching. The questions were fantastic. Thank you to everybody who asked questions, and I really appreciate them. Uh, so if you're not subscribed, you probably should be, and then you can go to the community tab and be alerted whenever I put out a Q&A or I I'll put out a question to people who watch the channel. There's a, it's useful for you to be subscribed as well. You can also support the channel by going to patreon.com slash paleocinema and contributing a few bucks there every month. Um, as always, look after yourself. Stay safe. Watch some good movies. Watch some bad movies. Watch some Australian movies and ask questions about them. And I'll catch you next time. <laughs>